I want to preach to you about Joseph. Joseph, from the pit to the palace. From the pit to the palace. We'll be in Genesis. Turn in your Bibles with me. Genesis chapter 37. We're going to go all the way to the end of Genesis, Lord willing, today. We won't read it all, but I do want to highlight some things from Joseph's life. From the pit to the palace. God's Word written by roughly 40 people over the span of a couple of thousand years, 66 books, three languages. There's one thread through it all in God's redemptive story, and His name is Jesus. We want to find Him in the pages of Scripture, but also in our lives as we walk with Him and talk with Him, as we surrender all to Him, as we turn our eyes to Jesus. So we're excited to dig in with you together today. Genesis 37 is where the story of Joseph begins in your Bible. So turn there with me. If you're ready for the word today, give your neighbor an elbow, fist bump, high five, something like that. And let's dig in to the word today. Genesis 37, I want to read to you the first 11 verses, and then I'll give you some principles from Joseph's story. Chapter 37, verse 1, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with sons, with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. My kids do this all the time. How about yours? Bring a bad report of their brother or sister. Verse three, now Israel, this is Jacob, same name uh, in in your Bibles, don't be confused. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. He was the great grandson of Abraham, by the way, those of you who were with us last week. He's the great grandson of Abraham. He's the 11th of 12 of the them. And he made him a robe of many colors. Verse 4, but when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, Joseph had a dream. I believe some of us today, you've got a dream. You've got a dream of what could be, should be. God's planted a vision in your life today, and you can relate with Joseph. And if you don't have one, God's got one for you, and we can all relate with Joseph. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? Not quite the dream you want to tell your big brothers, right? (laughs) Verse, uh, Verse 8 continuing here. So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream. And told it to his brothers, yes, again, and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow ourselves on the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying, in mind. Quite a start to Joseph's story, and we're going to go hop through several pieces of Joseph's story today, and I want to give you five principles, five things about God and his character and his attributes and his plans and his dreams and his vision that don't just apply to Joseph, but also apply to you, to me, and to where we are at in our lives. Write down number one. Here's principle number one. We see that God's plans often conflict with our logic. Not if you are living that in some way right now. Do you ever notice God's plans, his dreams, his vision, his purposes often go counterintuitively against sometimes even what I plan. I can relate right now. You know, we, we, if you talk about our church's transition, my transition, the call of God in my life, uh, we had plans. Remember we talked about having a list? You got a list? A list of your plans? Sometimes what God has mapped out for us surprises us. Sometimes it goes counterintuitive. It goes against the grain of what I planned and what I thought God was going to do. Joseph definitely felt that way because the first part of Genesis 37, Joseph has a dream. He hears it from the Lord. He's got plans, and I'm sure at that point he's envisioning how those plans would come to fruition. You ever do that? You hear from God, you read in Scripture, God puts something on your heart, and you start mapping it out. How many of you are the planners in the room? Some of us are just like, all right, three planners. Okay, the rest of you are asleep or nobody plans. Got it. I plan. And so I'm an around the corner kind of person. And so when I hear from God, I'm like, oh, how do we get there? Let's make a plan. Let's build a team. Let's get a strategy together. Let's get moving. Let's don't sit around and wait. Let's do it. How, how soon you want to do this, pastor? Yesterday, right? That's me. 
And I don't know where Joseph was in that, but I'm imagining he had envisioned what those plans and dreams would look like. Well, in this case, you know, my brothers are going to bow before me. What sibling doesn't want that to be God's plan for their life? But then the end of chapter 37 happens. His brothers are mad, and they're jealous, and they plot actually to murder him. And if you read about their history, they actually know how to do that. They've had a history of when they don't like something, kind of pitching a fit in a way of taking life. I mean, this is pretty serious stuff. Some of us would say, you know, hey, I want to kill my brother or my sister. We might say that. And in our house, we say, we don't say that. Um, But, you know, maybe you felt that way for sure. But they actually were going to carry it out. And by God's grace, Joseph doesn't end up dying, but he ends up being sold into slavery. He ends up in a pit. So you have two parts. It's the same chapter, Genesis 37, but two parts. God's dream and his vision and how it's starting to come together, and then what actually happens. The pit happens. He finds himself in a pit to be sold into slavery. Not what he had in his mind, I would imagine. But this is a chapter of God's vision. Listen, coming through plans, dreams, purposes that are bigger than Joseph's, bigger than ours, going against our rationale and our logic. And I want to ask you personally today, what is one situation right now in your life where God is not operating the way you think he should? Yeah, because if we're honest, we we may not say this. Some of you are super spiritual in your prayers. I'm actually not, just so you know. You may be sad to hear that, like, pastor is not super spiritual in his prayers. I pray. I just, here's the way I look at it. God already knows what I'm thinking, so I just say it. And you're like, oh my gosh, God knows exactly what I'm thinking, even that last thought. Yep, that one too. So I try to be open and honest in my prayers because it's a conversation. And if I'm honest, sometimes it's like, God, you're just not doing this thing right. They are like, that's blasphemy. I would never pray something like that. Yeah, you do in your heart, and God already knows you said it. You just didn't say it that way with those words. But we say, God, you're not doing this right, so I'm going to take over for this little stretch, right? You ever feel that way? Because logic says, need I say more? Logic says blank, but God's ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, uh, let's look at these together, these verses. Logic says, but God says is often what happens. It happened to Joseph. It happens to us. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Some of you are in the middle of a situation right now where you just cannot feel God's presence. You just can't see what God is up to. And I'll tell you, as a pastor, there have been so many times, even this year, where I've walked with people who are going through terrible things that they look to a pastor like, you're supposed to know what to say. What is God doing? And my answer is usually just an honest one to say, I don't know. I don't see it either. But I do know he's trustworthy. I do know his plans are always better than mine. I do know he redeems even the worst of things for his glory, for our good, and for purposes that are way bigger than ours. And I trust him. He is a good, good father. But a lot of times that goes against what I can see. His ways are not my ways. And I want to remind you today, listen, God is working even when you can't see his work. God has not given up on you even when you can't sense his presence. God has not given up on the vision and the dreams and the plans and the purposes he has for your life just because you made mistakes along the way. He's not done just yet, so we shouldn't be either. And I want to give you a practical principle. This is kind of an overarching principle, but in Joseph's dreams, he's 17. This is lessons from a 17-year-old. Usually lessons from a 17-year-old are going to be lessons of what not to do, right? How many of you remember the 17-year-old you? Anybody? Yeah. Lessons of what not to do. Well, Joseph had this dream. It was a true dream. What he told his brothers was good, but I'm going to give you this principle that I've given to you many times. Here it is. Write it down. Only say true things, but don't say every true thing. (laughs) good marriage principle. I've shared it over and over. You're like, why do you say that so much, pastor? Because it works and I don't do it real well. And until I get it right, I'm going to keep preaching it. And I'm guessing I'm not alone. But Joseph said a dream that was true. And so that part was okay. But listen, a dream where your brothers are going to bow down before you, you might just keep that one to yourself and get a little help to interpret where that's going. Or maybe just keep it to yourself and see if God brings it about. But nonetheless, even, listen, even in our over-talking, any over-talkers? All right, three of us, good. I know better. I've talked to some of y'all. Even in our over-talking, over-sharing, our misspeaking, like Joseph did, God redeems it and uses even our missteps and over-talking, misspeaking, to still bring about his plan because he's still 
on the throne. His plans don't always follow our logic, but his plans are always better than ours. And if that's true, we're going to need to know number two. Number two is this. Write this down. God never leaves us even when we feel alone. He never leaves us even when we feel alone. I'm going to read the beginning and the end of chapter 39. Don't worry. I'll come back to chapter 38. Some of you that read ahead are like, I wonder what pastor's going to do with chapter 38. And I'll share with you at the end of the message. But let's go back to exactly where Joseph's story picks up. It seems like an interruption, but I'll share with you how it's actually not. But verse 1 of chapter 39, I'll read the beginning and the end. And notice God's presence because God never leaves us even when we feel alone. Joseph is sold into slavery, and he ends up at Potiphar's house. Now, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had, brought, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. Circle it, underline it. You'll see it again. And became, he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he, and he made him overseer over his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all he had in house and in field. Skip to the end of the chapter, go to verse 21. I'll read through verse 23. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the keeper of the prison. Now, wait a minute. How did Joseph end up in prison again? We went to the pit. I thought we were at Potiphar's house. Well, we'll read the middle with the next point. I'm glad you asked. We'll get there in a moment. But he ends up in prison again. Verse 22, and the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. The Lord was with Joseph, did you see the theme? The beginning of the chapter, the end of the chapter, whether it's the pit, whether it's Potiphar's house, or it's now again in the prison. And by the way, spoiler alert, he ends up in prison again because he does the right thing. We'll talk about it in just a second. No matter what high or low Joseph found himself in, the Lord was with Joseph. Some of you are believing the lie from the enemy right now that the Lord is not with, fill in the blank with your name, that God has abandoned you, God has given up on you, but just as it was with Joseph, whether it's the highest of highs in the palace, the lowest of lows in the pit, God is with you, he is for you, and he loves you, and he will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus said, lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. Some of you came today just to be reminded that the Lord is with you, even when you feel alone. Joseph saw that, and he noticed even pagans, even prison guards, and prison keepers notice, they, like, gosh, there's something different about this Joseph. And I wonder if that can be said about me. You ever wonder that? In the highs of my life and the lows of my life, I wonder if people say, you know what? God's presence is definitely with that guy. I wonder if that can be said of me. It certainly was Joseph. They saw the presence of God all over Joseph. Can it be said of you and me? It's one thing to know it's there. It's another thing to exemplify that presence with how we walk through our highs and our lows. Even when God's plans conflict with our logic, we know God never leaves us, even when we feel alone. And we need to know those things because number three is coming, and here it is. Number three is that God helps us be steadfast in shaky situations. In shaky situations. Joseph found himself, he had a knack for finding himself in shaky situations. Can you relate? You ever find yourself in shaky situations where things are just not going according to plan? Go to verse 6 of Genesis 39. We'll fill in the blank. The bread of that sandwich is that the Lord is with Joseph. You saw that. What happened in the middle? Verse number 6 of Genesis 39. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. This is back at Potiphar's house. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was a handsome, he was handsome in form and appearance. How many of you are like, yeah, I can relate? Right. The rest of us are honest and like, not me. Verse 7, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me, fairly forward. Verse 8, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of my master uh, has no concern about anything in the house, means because he trusts me here, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then, underline this, we'll come back. How then 
Can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day, and he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, to be with her. Verse 11, but one day he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were in the house. She caught him uh, by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Verse 13, and as soon as she saw that he left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me. I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me, but as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Pretty shaky situation. And in Joseph's story, we find over and over, even contrasting with chapter 38, just this integrity, this steadfast faith that Joseph displayed over and over again. So he's falsely imprisoned here. And he stays in prison for quite some time, as we'll see with God's timing in just a moment. And we just read through that story, but I want to give you two questions that I know Joseph was having to answer that maybe you are too. One of them is, how do I trust in God's goodness when life is bad? Why does a good God let bad things happen? Maybe you're wrestling with that. How do I trust in God's goodness when life sure does seem bad? Another one, how do I stay steadfast when I act rightly but get treated wrongly? Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but you can take heart because I've overcome the world. He also said in the chapter before that, in John 15, he said, listen, if the world hated me, it'll hate you too. He's saying you will be persecuted. You will have problems. So when those happen, how do we stay steadfast? How do we not lose our faith? I want to give you uh, an acronym of RUN. That's what Joseph did, RUN. Write that down, R-U-N, RUN. And I want to give you an action step to go with each of those letters that'll help you be a steadfast Christian when you act rightly and get treated wrongly. Maybe when you act wrongly and you get treated poorly in that situation, or maybe you're in a situation where you just don't see the goodness of God. And write this down. Number one, R, remain focused on God. Remain focused on God. This is a theme of Joseph's story. He kept his eyes fixed on his God. He focused, listen, on how God feels about him above how others were going to feel about him and even how he felt about him. That's hard. Sometimes I am my biggest obstacle. Okay, let me be honest. I am always my biggest obstacle. Not if you agree. Everywhere I go, I show up there every single time. I can run from problems, but they follow me because I am there. And when it comes to running, sometimes I'll run away from things that God wants me to lean into, and I'll stay put and fester in things that God wants me to run away from. Joseph teaches us how to do it right, and it starts with this principle of remaining focused on God. Joseph shows us what that looks like. Let's go back to verse 9, Genesis 39, verse 9. What we see here is his response to Potiphar's wife, but notice what he says at the end of the verse. How then, I had you underline it, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against, we got to say that a little louder because that's the point, sin against God, God. I'm not doing this because it would displease God. His focus was on God, even though he could have gotten into self-preservation mode, all kinds of things going through his mind. I don't know what Potiphar's wife looked like, but I would imagine there was at least some level of temptation for Joseph in this situation, but he ran. Why? Because he didn't want to sin against his God. He talks about Potiphar first, but he ultimately ties it together because he doesn't want to sin against God. But if you're like me, so many times we sacrifice the plans and the purposes of God for momentary pleasures or for sinful pressures. And Joseph certainly felt both, but he remained focused on God. And we've got to remain focused on God if we're going to do the U. The U is to unhitch 
unhitch from your vices. That means to detach, to leave it alone, to run the other way, unhitch from your vices. Vices meaning the things, anything that the enemy is using to trip you up, to cause you to sin, to get distracted from God being your focus, to get distracted from God's plans and purposes. But here's the truth. When it comes to unhitching from our vices and the things that trip us up, most of the time, if we were in Joseph's shoes, let's say that was the vice, we would do something like, hey, I'm not going to lie with you, but let's just sit down and talk a little while. Or I'll text you later. That's not a sin, right? And this is kind of how it starts. It's a slow fade. It's an incremental process where we don't unhitch from the things, we don't detach and run from the things that the enemy is using to trip us up. Instead, we engage with it at a non-sinful level that goes to the next level, and then the next level, and then the next level. Joseph instead ran. He ran away. Look at verses 11 and 12 of Genesis uh, chapter 39. Particularly, let's go to verse 12. Verse 12, flip to verse 12. Let's look at what he does here. Lie with me, but what did he do? He left his garment. Now, that's a problem too right? And it became a problem as part of what led to prison. But he was so set on getting away from the vice and the sin that could have happened that he left it there. He left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. So I've got a personal question for you. And here it is. What are you dabbling in that you need to run from? What conversation are you having with that married person that's lingering too long? What are you lingering too long at on your screen? What problems, what avenues is the enemy using to trip you up? Because listen, I came to remind us today, we have a real enemy who wants to seek out to kill, steal, and devour, and distract you from all of the great things God wants to do in your life and through your life. And sometimes the greatest tools he uses are the little bitty things that we dabble in, that in and of themselves and the starting places are not quite so bad, but you know what they are. So what's one area that the enemy is using that you're dabbling in that you need to run from? To remain focused on God, we must unhitch from those vices and run from them. Let's talk about the end. The end is to nail down your dependence. Some of you, your dependence is shifting. You depend on God for a little while, then you depend on yourself for a little while. When God doesn't do it the way you think he should, you start depending on yourself. Or some of you are depending on a relationship and depending on the season, your dependence shifts and it changes. But what we see in Joseph's life is that he nails down his dependence. The story continues, chapters 39 through 41. Joseph is in prison for doing what was right. And he interprets dreams. He's not just a dreamer. He interprets dreams. He interprets dreams for others who are in prison. And they're getting out of prison, and they promise they're going to remember Joseph, put in a good word for Joseph. He has all this hope that is building, but they forget Joseph. And we learn, as we keep reading, that for over two years, he was in this prison, promised for doing what was right, promised that he would have a word put in for him, and he was waiting. He was wondering, what is God up to? And that is where we find Joseph here in this chapter As we talk about nailing down our dependence, I want to take you to chapter 41, Genesis 41 and verse 16. And this is when Pharaoh has a dream. And finally, somebody says, hey, I know a guy. You should talk to this Joseph guy. And he gets to talk to Pharaoh. And this is what he has to say to Pharaoh. Do not miss his answer. Now, if I'm Joseph, I might be like, yes, I got you, man. It's all me, right? I got this. Like, this is my chance. This is my shot. But here's what he says. Joseph answers Pharaoh it is not in me. Where is his dependence in this verse? It's not in me. Who's that? God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. I love his response. Even then, when it would be so easy to not detach from vices or sinful things, but maybe to detach from his relationship with God because God has not come through. Y'all with me here today? Some of you know what that's like, and you've been waiting on God. And instead of detaching from the stuff the enemy is feeding you, the lies that he keeps feeding you, you start to detach from your relationship with God, but not Joseph. He remained focused on God. He unhitched. He ran from. He detached from all of the things that the enemy wanted to use to steal, kill, and devour God's plan and dreams for his life. And it all culminates with the fact that he nailed down his dependence on his God and never himself. It's easy to start depending on the wrong things, but not Joseph. 
Because number four still happens. Even though we're steadfast, number four, we learn that God's dreams usually don't happen in our timing. Can I get an amen? Some of y'all are still waiting. Dream, a vision God's put in your heart, and God's timing just doesn't make sense. His ways, his thoughts are not our ways and our thoughts, but his timing sure doesn't make sense either. It's like, hurry up, Lord. You ever said that in your prayer? I have. Like, hurry up. What are you waiting for? And in chapters 41 through 50, we see a picture of the culmination of the dreams. Remember point one, God's dreams don't usually align with our own logic. Well, Joseph's dream didn't happen for quite some time. So after Joseph interprets the dream of Pharaoh in Genesis 41, he gets promoted. He goes from the pit to Potiphar's house, back to prison, and now he becomes a prime minister. He's Pharaoh's house. He's his right-hand man. He's second in command over all of Egypt. He's now in the palace, from the pit to the palace. This is where we find him in Genesis 41. And, and it's because of the dream that he interpreted. It was a dream of famine and a dream that would foretell a coming famine through which God would promote Joseph, put him in the palace, make him a ruler that would be able to help countries and people through this famine. They would store up grain, they would be able to give it out, and they would make it through the famine. Joseph is a hero, he is in the palace, and through that, Genesis 42 through 50, he's reunited with his brothers. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, my, how the tables have turned. And he does a little of that maybe. He has several tests that he put them through. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of those, but in 42 through 50, you can see several tests. Like he asks them a lot of questions, but th he recognizes them. They don't recognize him until later. And I'll give you that encounter in just a minute. But what we see is that dream of them bowing down before him. It does get fulfilled, but there was a long time in that process. And Genesis 42, verse 6, here's what we see happening. Genesis 42, 6, Joseph was the governor of the land. He was the one who sold all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Does that sound familiar? God fulfills that dream, that vision, that plan, the one that maybe he should have done this about. Well, it actually happened. But for those of you who are waiting, anybody you're like, you're just waiting, you're in a season of waiting on something, you'll just be honest, say, yeah, yeah, good, yeah. For honest, that's kind of what happens when you follow Jesus. He makes you wait. I call it the P word. Anybody else know what the P word is? I can't even say it. Y'all got to help me. Yeah, you said it. Patience. Oh, patience. I'm so impatient. I'm so impatient. But if you're in a season of waiting, let's look at a few numbers. I want to give you six uh, numbers here. They're the ages of Joseph, starting with a few ages of Joseph. 17. 17. That's how old Joseph was when he had the dream, when God gave him this vision, when God gave him this plan, when the sheaves bowed down to his, the one he shared every true thing about. He was 17 when God gave him this plan. Next number is 30. Several years go by, and this is actually when Joseph... Uh, was promoted. He goes from the pit to Potiphar's house to prison, and he goes from the prison now to the palace at age 30. That's a pretty long span already. But then it's age 39 when his dream was fulfilled. So when his brothers come to him and ask for grain, he's 39 years old, and he doesn't die until 110. 110, that's the fourth age. 110 years old, we learn at the end of Genesis 50 that he dies. But there's two key numbers I want to point out to you. The first one is this, 71. 71. 71 years Joseph lived. There were problems during this period, but he lived overall in peace and prosperity. He was reunited with his brothers and his family. He lost people during that time, so it had highs and lows. But this is what Joseph had in mind here. When he was 17 and he had a dream, he had this in mind. But notice this at the end. And I wonder if this Joseph, what he would say to that Joseph. I'm guessing it would go something like this. Hey, this span's going to be really hard, but hang in there because you're going to find out how God's plans are way better than your plans. You're going to want to give up, but I'm living proof right now of the faithfulness of God. So Joseph, 17 to 39-year-old Joseph, don't you give up. The other number is 22. 22 is the span from when he had the dream to when it was fulfilled. Some of you are living in this Joseph. Here you are, you're waiting, you're waiting. I wanna give you a challenge while you wait. Some of you are like, no, Joseph had it easy. I've been waiting 32 years. <laughs> I 
I've been waiting 42 years. I don't know what you're waiting on or what the pause feels like or how the faithfulness of God, maybe we're even misdefining thinking that, man, God's just not coming through. You know Joseph had all of those emotions to get to that 71-year span. There was this hard 22-year span, and there was highs and lows. He got promoted in it, but man, it had the pit too. It had the pits. It had the prisons. It also had the palaces in his life and people in his life that he impacted through that journey. And I want to challenge you with something. If you're in a season of waiting right now, how many of you, first of all, would say, I'm like you, pastor. I don't wait well. <laughs> I'm impatient. If that's you, I'm going to give you a word. It starts with W. It's a verb that you can do in your waiting. Worship while you are waiting. That means trusting God and his timing, even when it doesn't make sense. Knowing that God is good, even when life is bad. Knowing that no matter what life throws my way, my God is faithful. In the 22-year blocks, I will trust him, even when his logic, his timing doesn't make sense. Because I know number five is true. Here's number five, that God redeems all things, all things for his glory and our good. Genesis 50, the big reveal happens, and his brothers now know who Joseph is, and some of you are like, yes, does he, does he send them to, to, to be executed? Does he humiliate them? What does he do? And I want to show you verse 20 of Genesis chapter 50. This is what Joseph said. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. <laughs> to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. He was focused on God. He depended on God. His definitions were God's definitions, like good? None of that was good. Being thrown into a pit, told my father that I was dead, that's not good, but God meant it for good. They meant evil, but God meant it for good. And Romans 8, 28, it was true then, and it's just as true now, that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are the called according to to his purposes. It was true for Joseph, and it is true for us. Now, some of you are like, you, you still skip chapter 38. It, it feels like an interruption. By the way, it's like PG-13 plus kind of a chapter. It's like the most sexually explicit chapter in your Bibles, perhaps. Genesis chapter 38 has to do with Judah and Tamar and this incestual relationship that happens and the carrying on of a, a bloodline through, through a widow. It's, it's, a, it's total TV drama. Some of you are like, I didn't know that was in the Bible, and that's going to be the first chapter you read this week to see if it's true. It's there. And it feels like an interruption. It's just like chapter 37 is Joseph, and then chapter 39 is Joseph, and then there's this weird thing with one of his brothers. Judah's one of his brothers right here in the middle. Why? It feels like an interruption. You ever get an interruption in the chapters of your journey, the chapters of your story? Yeah. Well, that's what this feels like. But really, when you look at the history, you look at what God does, we're talking about finding Jesus in God's redemptive story. You know what happens? Judah, Judah becomes the bloodline that ultimately leads to the Davidic dynasty, meaning David's bloodline. And if you've ever read Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus, where the other gospel writers started with the, the birth of Jesus, Matthew decided, I'm going to start with the genealogy of Jesus. You're going to find, listen, don't miss this, that God does redeem all things, good, bad, ugly, highs, lows. God redeems all things, even to bring about the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sin of the world because it was Jesus. Judah's bloodline that ultimately would lead to the birth of Christ. And God took this horrific situation and all of these mistakes, and he still redeemed it for good to send forth his son to take away the sin of the world. It's true for Joseph. It's true for Judah. And it is true for you and me. God's not done. Go celebrate that. If you believe that, that God is not done, that God can take all good things, let him know. We praise God for that. Even the Genesis chapter 38s of our life. You probably got one too, but God redeems all things for his glory and our good. I want to leave you with this question, whether you're in the pit or the palace today, I don't know where you're at, maybe somewhere in between, whether you're in the pit or the palace, how is God causing you, calling you to run, remain focused on him, unhitched from some vices and nail down your dependence on him? How's God calling you to run, to take a steadfast step of faith this week? I believe that as we take that steadfast step of faith, remaining focused on him, turning away from the stuff the enemy is trying to use to tear us apart, maybe leaning into something that you want to run from, but maybe running from something that you're tempted to keep leaning into, 
and we nail down our dependence knowing that it is all him, I believe God's got something really special for you this week. I want to ask you to bow your heads, ponder that for just a few moments, and ask God, what is it that you're trying to ask of me? Maybe it's to be uh, saved, to take a step of salvation as we're talking of finding Jesus. You found him today. Maybe it's to be baptized, to join a life group, to start serving somewhere. Maybe it's a relational step that God has led you into today from Joseph's story. But some of you as believers are praying for that step. Some of you would say, today I just need to know that I'm a part of the family of God. Man, you eloquently said a few things. Some of the stuff didn't make sense. I don't know what's going on here, but I just need Jesus. If that is where you are, Jesus is for you. No matter what's going on in your heart and life, still it for just a moment. Be still, be quiet before the Lord, and just cry out to him something like this from your heart. Say, Jesus, I know I am so messed up, and I'm a sinner. I know I'm separated from you, but I need you. I know you died for me. I know you're alive. Today, I surrender. I give you me, all of me. Will you save me and forgive me? That's you in your own words. Cry out to Jesus. Ask him to save you, and you shall be saved.